The title of the message today is Remember to be Fruitful, and today we're looking at verse 8. So if you have your Bibles open, let's pick it up in verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and what you have for us today. And we do pray now, Lord, that you would continue that work that you've begun in each one of us. Lord, that you would continue to teach us, Lord, your plans, your purposes. And Lord, help us to uh, be reminded of all the things that you want to remind us of today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, there are certain truths that the Bible says that we need to be constantly reminded of over and over again. I think one of the reasons it's important to go to church is because we're forgetful. Have you ever forgot your PIN to your ATM? Have you ever forgot your password to Amazon or to Facebook? Uh, some of you are like, no, Pastor Bob. We never forget anything, <laughs> right? But I have. And that's why it's so important to go to church because we need to be reminded. And over and over through the Bible, <clears throat> we are told that ministers are told to remind God's people even of things that they've heard before that they know. In Jude 1, verse 5, it says, But I want to remind you, though you once knew this. In 2 Timothy 1, he tells them, Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my, of my hands. In 2 Peter 1, he says, For this reason I will not neglect to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. In other words, he's saying, even though God's people know these things, they need to be reminded. Why? Well, because they forget, right? And he goes on here in Titus in verse 1, and he tells them, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey and to be ready for every good work. Now, we went through that on Wednesday night, but the Apostle Paul's telling Titus, to remind them of these truths, even though they already know them, right? Most of you know you should obey the law, right? Most of you know that. (laughs) Now, some of you, it's been in question some time of your life, but most of you know that little sign that's white that says 3-5 on it. You know what that means. It means that it should match the number on your dash, right? Now, just because you know it doesn't mean you always do it, right? (laughs) And so that's important for us to understand because sometimes Christians get this idea that every time I come to church, I should be learning some new thing that I've never heard before, uh, right? But, and it is true that we should continue to be learning and growing. But quite often, we need to be reminded of truths that we know from God's word that we're not doing. Maybe we've learned them, we've heard them, maybe many times, but we're not doing them. And so it's important for us to realize sometimes we're going to come to church and we're going to hear things repeated. I've heard, over the years, I've been a pastor for a while, and over the years I've heard many people say, well, I've been to that study before, or I, you know, have heard that before. And my very next question is always the same. But are you doing it? Because knowing it and doing it are not the same. You know what the speed limit is. That doesn't mean you do it, right? Uh, and, and so here he's told in verse 1, Paul tells Titus, and there's some things they need to be reminded of. And he says, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. So he's reminding them to be ready for good work. Verse 8, affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. So there he says that we need to be reminded to be fruitful, to maintain good works in verse 1 and verse 8, and then also in verse 14. Let your people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. Right? So God does not want our lives to be unfruitful. And here in Titus chapter 3, Paul tells Titus to remind God's people over and over again that we need to be fruitful, right? And a fruitful life involves maintaining good works. Being fruitful is something that God desires for all of our lives. When you think about your life, God created you with a plan and a purpose, and there are things that he wants you to do. And and I think it's important to note, though, we're not doing good works to earn salvation. In Galatians 2, verse 16, it says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even uh, we, uh, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So that's pretty clear, right? We're not justified by doing good works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 make it even clearer. It says, for by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we don't go to heaven because of our good works. It's a gift from God. And now, but it's important to note the very next verse, right? Salvation's a gift of God, but the ne- very next verse in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 say, it's by grace, not of works, lest you should boast. No one's going to be in heaven boasting about 
man, I'm so good, I'm here, right? And, and no one's going to be looking at anybody else like, how did you get in? You know, man, like, there's not going to be none of that, right? Uh, the very next verse in Ephesians 2.10, it says this, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, when God created you, he has a plan for your life. He has good things for you to do, right? And, and God created you not to earn salvation, but to, to do good works. Now, good works, biblically, are a response to what Jesus has had already done for us. When you become born again, when you have a personal relationship with God, and you experience God's forgiveness, his transformation, his cleansing of your heart and mind and soul, when he empowers you by the Holy Spirit to have victory over the flesh and over sin, and he removes the guilt and the shame of all the mistakes of the past, well, then we, we have a response to that, right? I mean, if I stood at the front door and I gave you each a suitcase with $10 million in it, you probably would say, thank you. What could I do for you, right? You would say, give me that, dude. Move out of the way, right? I mean, when you think about what God's done for us, and, and many of us, we respond by thinking, God, how can I express, express my gratitude or my thankfulness, right? What can, I, what can I do, Lord, to bless you? Now, I'm not trying to earn salvation, but I just want to express my gratitude for all that God's done for me. And, and so uh, we think, or we even say out loud in our prayers, God, how can I use what you've given me to show my thankfulness, my appreciation for your love and your forgiveness in my life? What can I do? Now, here's the thing. When you think that, it's good because God's word tells us how to respond. See, God's desire is that your life would be fruitful. In John 15, 16, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Now, I love that. When you think about your relationship with God, God chose you. And, and what did Jesus say? Why he chose you? That you can have a fruitful life, right? God wants you to have a fruitful life. He doesn't want anyone to live a barren life. He wants your life to be fruitful. Now, in Titus here, Paul's telling Titus in verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly. Now, I was thinking about, as a pastor of this church, do I affirm constantly that those who believe in God should be careful to maintain good works, right? Well, I'm affirming you today, <laughs> right? Uh, that you need to maintain good work, right? God wants you to be fruitful. Uh, remember to be fruitful. Now, Titus lived in Crete, and uh, it was an island, and, and they had a reputation for being rebellious, and, and, uh, and, and so he's reminding them, right? And so uh, we know Proverbs 24:30 tells us uh, where he says, I went by a field of a lazy man and by the vineyard of a man devoid of understanding. Now, a, a lazy man is devoid of understanding. That means he's clueless, right? Devoid means he's completely lacking understanding. Uh, and, and when you read Proverbs 24 about this lazy man, God tells us that when a person is lazy and neglectful, it affects everyone around him. It affects himself. It affects his family, his neighbors, uh, his ability to help other people, right? And so Solomon concludes there in, in Proverbs 24 that your life is going to produce something, right? Either through neglect or faithfulness. Through neglect, it's going to produce poverty. Through faithfulness, it's going to produce fruitfulness. And so in the New Testament, 1 Timothy 4, 14 tells us, do not neglect the gift that is in you. The Bible says that God has given every one of us gifts, abilities, talents, resources, and the Bible says we shouldn't neglect to use them to help other people. Now, everybody in this room knows Jesus said, love your neighbor, right? But, but are you using the gifts and the resources and the talents to do that? Jesus told a parable uh, that uh, we should be using what the Lord has given us, and we shouldn't be lazy, right? Uh, the Bible teaches throughout that we should work hard, right? And, and there in Matthew 25, 14, this verse had a great impact on my life when I read it the first time. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his servants and delivered his goods to them. To one he gave five talents, another two, and another one, each man according to his own ability, and uh, immediately went on a journey. So here this picture is, God has entrusted uh, things to each person, right, for the use of the kingdom. And if we're faithful in using them, uh, then uh, God said he will entrust us with more. In verse 20, he goes on to say, so that he who received five talents came back and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside, beside them. And he said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, the, all of us want to hear that when we get to heaven. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. Now, notice, few things. 
It wasn't a lot. Because sometimes we can think, and when I heard this sermon one time as a new believer, I remember thinking, well, I don't have anything, so I'm not responsible for anything. But notice he said a few things. Everybody in this room has a few things, right? He said, uh, you were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I love that. When you are faithful in using what God has put in your life, then it's going to bring joy to your life, right? It brings joy to work hard. Now, our society, because it's becoming more secular, uh, it, it's missing out on that. There are people who are missing out on meaning and purpose, and really the Bible teaches us that doing what God created us to do and using what he's given us to do with uh, brings joy. And, and he says God will entrust you more. But in verse 24, there's another alternative where he says, then he would receive one talent, came and said, I was afraid, and went and hid your talent in the ground, and look, uh, there you have what is yours. And the Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. Right? So, so there was another person that he gave a talent to, and he didn't do anything with it. Right? In other words, the person that didn't try to use what God gave him, he said to him, you're wicked and lazy. Now, this gives us great insight into how God wants us to live our lives. God wants all of us to work hard right? and to be a blessing to those around us. And, and this is so good. When my kids were little, uh, I taught them from when they were in first grade. I said, look, you need to work hard because one day you're going to grow up, and you're going to get a wife and have children, and you're going to need to take care of them. So you need to work hard, do well, all those sort of things. And so you need to start practicing working hard now. And so, uh, you know, it's so important for us to recognize God wants us to work hard. Work is a good thing, right? I mean, uh, it, it, it brings joy. Now, the world has a counterfeit to God's fruitfulness, right, to, to what God talks us about. Uh, socialism, communism, uh, they have this thing called activism, right, being an activist. And uh, public protests, those sort of things. And the Marxist Manifesto has a list of issues that you can be an activist for. And uh, if you, you know, read their manifesto, uh, they want to eliminate the middle class. They want to have a cashless society. They want equity, globalism, government control of everything, uh, taxpayer-funded sex change for minors without parental consent, taxpayer-funded uh, abortions for minors without parental consent. And, and really, uh, you know, this is, you know, kind of the, the thing that socialism, communism, Marxism is pushing in our society. And, and people think that it's going to bring the same sort of fulfillment and joy in life as following the Lord and doing what the Lord has called us to do. But it doesn't, right? And you say, well, Pastor Bob, how do you know? Have you lived in Russia? Well, I have not lived in Russia. But I did read uh, an article uh, in 1918. The Soviets issued decrees on the uh, abolition of marriage and on civil partnerships. Uh, children and ownership, marriage could be declared without the involvement of state, and divorce could be obtained just as easily. Now, uh, there are people in our country that want to get rid of marriage, destroy the family, and, and the same sort of thing. It, it's communist Marxism, right? As one Russian journalist summarized, divorce was a matter of choice, abortions were legalized, and all that implied total liberation. So they were liberal, right? And uh, of family and sexual relations. Uh, a Russian writer at the time observed, it was not unusual occurrence for a boy of 20 to have had three or four wives or a girl of the same age to have had three or four abortions. Now you say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, <clears throat> that's what they believe, right? Do whatever you want. Now, it's been 106 years later since that time, and yesterday I read this headline, which I couldn't have made this up, right? Here's the headline on Fox News. Russia pushes sex at work scheme as population crisis escalates, <laughs> And the article went on to say, the Kremlin's top doctor this week encouraged all Russians to engage in sex at work scheme in a move to back President Vladimir Putin's attempts to counter popular, a growing population crisis. Despite cash incentives, tax breaks, nationwide push to discourage abortions, and Putin's years-long uh, attempt to encourage procreation across the country, Russia saw its lowest birth rate in the last uh, quarter century for uh, the first six months of 2024, report said, following UN findings uh, on worldwide population rates. When pressed by a female reporter uh, about when women are supposed to find time to manage a family, Russian health minister Dr. Uh, Yevgevna Stefovleffa, uh, <clears throat> whatever his name is, he, here's what he said to the women, woman reporter, being very busy at work is not a valid reason but a lame excuse. And then here it is. There are people who work 12 to 14 hours 
And when they do not make, uh, when do they have time to make babies? And the the uh, uh, health minister, Shetsustofla, uh, uh, asked, and he's, uh, when asked, according uh, to the report by Metro, he said, you can engage in procreation during your breaks. <laughs> he replied, uh, before adding, life quickly flies by. Now, I couldn't have made that up, right? Now, this is when people fall for the counterfeit, right? You get to the place where you do all these wrong things, and your society now doesn't have enough children to sustain society. They're at 140 million. They're going to go to 130 million. I mean, their society, their, it, the population is decreasing because of their philosophy. And now their new philosophy is have sex on your breaks at work. That'll fix it. I mean, just like, I mean, <laughs> now, lest we laugh at Russia, I don't want to talk about what's going on in our government. Anyway, but here's the thing. That is a counterfeit. That's opposite to biblical fruitfulness, right? And there are people in our country that say, yes, we want that. We want, you know, Marxism. We want socialism, right? And it's like, well, you should live there for a while because that's very different than what goes on uh, in biblical fruitfulness. In verse 14 where he says, let our people also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. So we're given this reminder today to maintain good works to live a fruitful life fruitful life. Now, what kind of fruit does God want us to bear? Does he want us to be activists? Uh, do, what, what does the Bible say? What kind of fruit? Well, the Bible talks about a lot of different kinds of fruits that we experience in our lives. One of them is being thankful. Hebrews 13, 15 says, therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So when we come to church and we're worshiping the Lord, and we're giving thanks, or in your prayer time, you're giving thanks, or just giving thanks at your, like, that's fruit that God wants out of our lives. And, and that's so important that you understand. The Bible teaches that God wants you to be a thankful person. And here's the thing. It blesses you. It's good for you physiologically, psychologically, emotionally, and it's good for the people around you. When you are a complainer and a whiner, it's not good for you, your own physical health, and it's not good for the people around you. I mean, I've asked this before many times. How many of you want to go on vacation with a whining, complaining, negative Eeyore? Raise your hand. <laughs> Nobody, right? Uh, so the Bible tells us God wants us to be thankful. And then another fruit is holiness. Romans 6.23 says, But now having been set free from sin, then having become, uh, become slaves of God, uh, you have your fruit to holiness, right? So the Bible tells us that holiness is a fruit in our life that God wants uh, to work. And the Apostle Paul urge those Christians in Rome to pursue a holy life. In Hebrews 12, 14, he says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, we live in a time where people are pushing people to be unholy and immoral and, you know, just be involved in all sort of immoral things. The Bible tells us that if you want to experience a fruitful life, you want to experience the best kind of life, then you want to be thankful. You want to live a holy life. We need to pray, Lord, help me to live a a pure life, a clean life, a holy life, not a filthy, dirty life. And then another fruit is to be a giver. In Philippians 4.17, he said, not that I seek the gift that I, uh, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. In other words, he was talking about the, the fruit that comes from giving financially. So being a giver is a fruit that God wants to work on our lives. And being a giver is opposite of being a taker. Now, if I were to ask you, do any of you know anybody who's a taker? All they do is take, 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 me, me, me. They never give. Before I was a Christian, when I was a heathen, we had a term for it. We called them a sponge, right? So if someone was, you know, someone just came around and they always wanted to, well, I won't tell you what they wanted to do, but if they came around and always wanted to just take, take, take and, and never give, then we called them a sponge. Like, hey, you're a sponge. You know? All you do is take, right? But, but God wants your life to be fruitful, that you'd be a giver. That when you come around, people are like, oh, we're so glad to be around you. You're so giving, right? And that's what God wants. Now, uh, in Acts 20, verse 35, Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, that's not just for NFL linebackers. That's for all of us, right? That uh, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And, you know, uh, all of us at, at, at birthdays or Christmas, we give people gifts, and it's such a joy to give gifts. And now that I'm a, a, a grandfather, I love to give gifts to my grandkids, right? I love to give gifts to my kids. And it is truly more blessed to give than it is to receive. Now, uh, God wants to work that in our lives where, where we're people who want to be a blessing. And, and the truth is, when you are a giver, then it blesses you physiologically, emotionally, psychologically. When you 
and it blesses the people around you, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your workers, your coworkers, right? When you're at work and you're a person who's willing to give of your effort, your energy, your time, and other people are selfish, like, I, don't, I only do what I have to do and then I go home, right? Well, right, that's not going to produce the kind of fruit God wants. And then another fruit the Bible says is love. Galatians 5.22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. And love, I believe, is the ultimate fruit. When your life is overflowing with the love of God, then you want to be thankful. You don't want to be a complainer. You want to live a holy life. When you're overflowing with the love of God, you don't want to live an unholy life. You want to be a giver. You don't want to be a taker, right? Because God works in us and he transforms us. Jesus said in Mark 12, 29, the first of, uh, the first of all the commandments is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then verse 31, the second, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So basically, it just summarized to love God and love people, and that equals God's plan for a fruitful life. Pretty simple, right? Because sometimes people think it's so complex, but, but love is the ultimate fruit, and I believe that we need to be reminded that God wants your life to be overflowing with fruit like thankfulness, holiness, to be a giver, to be loving, all those sort of things. And the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy, you need to remind the church of these things. They need to be reminded. Now, I'm sure most of you in this room know much of the stuff that we talked about. Yes, I'm supposed to be loving, thankful, right, giving. But do you always do that, right? Sometimes we don't do it. Sometimes we get on a binge where we don't do it for a long time. And we need to be encouraged. We need to be reminded, why does God tell us to do this? Well, because he loves us. And it's what produces the best kind of life. You know, uh, my wife asks me all the time, so how's it been being married to me? We've been married quite a long time now. I think like 38 years. And I say, it's great. And, and the reason that it's great is that both of us want to have a fruitful life. We want to do what God tells us to do. We get up in the morning and pray and say, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Help me to, to do what you want me to do today, right? To love people, to bless people, to be a giver, to live a holy life, to, to be a person who is thankful, all those sort of things. And it is wonderful to be around people who are fruitful, right? And, and it's so wonderful to be around people here at church that just are walking in the spirit and their lives are overflowing with the fruits that God wants in their lives. And so Paul is uh, telling Timothy or Titus, you need to remind people that this is important. This is very important. And so he says in verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly. So I don't know if that means I'm supposed to preach this sermon next Sunday, but affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. It benefits you, right, to live a fruitful life. So you need to remember to be fruitful. Remember that God wants you to be fruitful. And how do you do it? Sometimes you think, well, Pastor Bob, it's hard. Well, how, how do we really do that? Because sometimes it's difficult to do all those things. Well, Jesus tells us that we can't do it without him. Right? He said, without me, you, you can't do it. And in John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Right? So faithfulness comes from abiding in Christ. And, and what does that mean? Well, it means to have a relationship with him. It means that you abide in him. It means that you invite him into your life every day. It means that you, you get up and you pray and you say, Lord, I want to be fruitful today. I, I want to live a life the way you want me to live. It means you spend time praying and listening to God to, to, to do the things that he tells you to do. That means you spend time going to church and worshiping him and serving him. Right? And all of us have different things to do. God has created each one of us different. And not everybody here is going to be a preacher, get up in front of a church and teach, but God has good works for you to do. He created you for good works to do. Now, we need to be reminded, oh, what is that? Now, what is it for you? I don't know. You need to pray. And as you abide in Christ, it's a natural byproduct. Just when you're praying every day, what would, what would you have me to do? Then you begin to, to do things that God just leads you. Hey, go help that person. Or go talk to that person. Hey, invite that person to church. Hey, maybe you should teach Sunday school. You have five kids and you're not involved in children's ministry, <laughs> right? Maybe they need help, right? Whatever it is, it's different for everyone, right? Maybe you're gifted musically and you should play in the worship band or, or whatever it might be. Maybe you uh, love, you're, you're a happy person, you love to greet people, and, you know, maybe you, you want to be a greeter, whatever it is. But it's different for every one of us. But ultimately, how you bear fruit is by abiding in Christ. But it isn't something that we work up on our own, that we pray and you say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, help me to be thankful. Help me to be a giver. How do I do that? Lord, help me to, to love people. How do I do that? And there are so many ways, different ways, but as we abide in Christ, then he works in us. He transforms us. 
and it just becomes a natural thing. So I want to encourage you to remember to be fruitful. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. And Lord, we do pray for all of us that you would help us, Lord, to uh, be fruitful. Lord, that as we abide in you, Lord, that, that, that just the natural byproduct would be fruit coming from our lives. Lord, your love as we walk in the Spirit. So we thank you for your word today, and we pray that you would just stir our hearts, Lord, uh, to know what it is that you would have us to do, the good works that you foreordained for us to walk in. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.